The Culture Pop Podcast is brought to you by the law offices of Jacob and Ronnie. Accident or injury, call Jacob and Ronnie. Call Jacob. Hey, it's Mace. If you or a friend or loved one is injured in an accident, the first person you should call is my friend Jacob. When I did this, Jacob was great. He helped me by talking through the next steps, which really put my mind at ease. When you're injured in an accident, you got to have an expert. That's why you call Jacob, just like I did. Call Jacob, 844-24-JACOB. That's 844-24-JACOB. Or visit calljacob.com. Call Jacob. Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Culture Pop Podcast. I'm Steve Mason, along with Sue Kalinsky. Sue Baloo, what's happening? <laughs> oh, what? What? It's something. Well, you know, um, I, I get to be a little last minute sometimes, right? Okay, right. So I went to print out my notes for our interview today. Okay, got it. And the printer wouldn't stop printing. Oh, no. And it didn't print any. There's no ink on the page. Wow. But it just kept printing and printing and printing. And I tried to stop it, uh, to cancel it. I'm yeah. looking for the printer icon. Yeah. I, and, and it won't stop it. It's like a science fiction movie. It's like, it I, sounds like Lucy and Ethel at the chocolate factory. The chocolate that factory. Keeps coming out. <laughs> I wish I had a partner here to laugh with. <laughs> yeah. So I opened the drawer and then, of course... It's jammed now. Right, right. And, and then I fix that. Okay. And, and then I try it again. And it just it keeps on doing the same thing. I open the drawer again. I call Tom in a yeah. panic. Yeah. He's trying to help me. He says, well, just, you know, look at the icon on the top of your screen on your computer. And I'm like, right. oh, really? Where's that? <laughs> it's not there. Okay, so what's the end result? Does that mean you have no notes for our conversation with Will Brill, one of the to, stars of well, Fellow Travelers? I, well, that's why it was a little late. I asked you for five more minutes. I'm, I just hand wrote my notes on, on paper. Oh, okay. All right, good. So, so we do have notes. We're ready to the guest, by the way, Will Brill, who plays Roy Cohn, the despicable Roy Cohn in Fellow Travelers, which is a show that we love. We had Ron Nicewaner, uh, the creator of the show on uh, a couple of weeks back. And it, my favorite show of 2023, for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we got a couple of things before we, first of all, uh, I've been seeing movies, Sue. It's that time of year. I've been seeing movies and I saw a couple of really interesting ones. Uh, one of them is called Anatomy of a Fall. And this is a French film. Uh, it's set in the French Alps. It's about a troubled marriage and a mysterious death. And Sandra Fuller is so good in this movie. Now, what did you think of Anatomy of a Fall? Is that her name? Oh, so oh, it's, and Sandra Holler, that's, that's the character's name. Sandra Holler's the character's name? Yeah. Her, uh, her name is um, Evan, is it Evan or Evan Hulia? Is it Sandra, really? Yeah. Sandra's the character's name. Oh, well, it's easier than the other name, isn't it? <laughs> right, so we could just call her Sandra. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I, for some reason, I have that. <laughs> Maybe my printer is broken. I don't have that in my notes. Um, all right, so Sue, what did you think, regardless of the lead actress's name, uh, what did you think of Anatomy of a Fall? I love this movie so much. Yes. It was so distressing. Disturbing. It was. I, I love that. You you, you kind of you, you don't know. Yep. I mean, I love that the, the the crime aspect of it. I love the filming of it. Yep. Um. The the cinematographer became a documentarian. Yeah. During certain parts of the film. Um. I loved how 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 intimate it it was shot, and yep. it was one particular scene in the courtroom with the son. And it was reminiscent of Mike Nichols when he did Carnal Knowledge, where he just kept the camera on Candace Bergen while um, while the other actors uh, had a conversation. Right, right. And he, this this guy, did the same thing. He just mm -hmm. kept the camera on the kid while the while the prosecutor and 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 the judge and the um, the defense attorney were were talking back and forth. Okay, I want to just quickly point out. Her name is Sandra Holler. Her character is Sandra Voiter, but the actress's name is Sandra Holler. Oh, it's so crazy because when I looked up her name, yeah, it's Holler, but it, it spelled her name E-V-E-N. 
Mm, no, IMDb has it as Sandra Huller, H two dots over the U L L E R, the double mm -hmm. dot. I don't know what that means. Do you know what the double dot means over a U? I, 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 I don't know the name for that, okay. and I should. I feel like yeah, I, need I should too. I, I, I went to college and everything. Uh, I think the thing I love about her performance is it feels so real. It feels so poised. It feels so stony cold at mm -hmm. the trial. Like there's not, she's not an emotional. Uh, there's no emotional testimony. Um, right. It's really re and the, the fascinating way that sort of the layers of their relationship are revealed a little bit at a time. It's immediately one of my favorite movies of the year, Anatomy of a Fall, and it is available for rent on Amazon Prime and on, uh, what, Apple. Yeah, and great, a great movie. I think Best Picture nominee. I think she's definitely going to be a Best Actress nominee. Well, it won the Palme d'Or. Yeah, it won the Palme d'Or, exactly. By the way, France did not submit it for the Best Foreign Language Film. Uh, category because so it won't be competing in that category they went with a movie called the taste of things which is 100 percent in french they felt like this is about 60 percent in french they felt like it wasn't really a french film because only 60 percent of the movie is in french now it's unfortunate because it would have been when best foreign language film i think going away oh totally and i think that there should be a new category now for um best dog oh best dog yeah best dog yep. was amazing yeah yeah really good performance for the dog and, and the for the kid, little boy the little, the little boy was boy. great you yeah. know you know you haven't seen a kid be nominated for an academy award in in a while I, I i right um and he is i mean i don't know whether he was nominated you know uh for the french you know academy awards yeah um but he was incredible yeah really was and it's funny you talk about kids being nominated for awards. Years ago, Jackie Weaver and I did a QA at uh, my theaters out in Palm Springs. And she was nominated for Best Supporting Actress for a movie called Animal Kingdom, which is a great movie, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the nominees was Haley Steinfeld, um, who was a little girl played in True Grit. And she was great. So I was talking to Jackie off. Mike about sort of the other nominees and stuff. And she said of Haley Steinfeld, she's just a girl. She's just a girl. Um, and it is really weird that a little kid can win an Academy Award over somebody who's been doing this for 30, 40, 50 years. You know, I know what you're saying, but you know, you look at Tatum O'Neill. She was great. And you look at Patty Duke. You uh, know? And you look at, I, don't, I forget if he won Haley Joel Osment, but he carried uh, the Sixth Sense. So, so there are definitely performances that won't. Anna Pac Paquin run uh, right. one for the for piano. The piano. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm against little kids winning Oscars. Give them to people who've been working at this for a really long time. I, the other movie I saw soon, it's a movie called Poor Things. I don't think you've seen it yet, have you? I haven't seen it. And I really don't know much about it. Although the images that I've seen, it looks really weird. It is crazy. Yeah. So I won't spoil it in any okay. way. The movie's called Poor Things. It stars Emma Stone. Uh, she already won one Oscar for La La Land. I think she's going to win again for this movie. Um, it is, it's an experience. It's a really strange world uh, with Emma Stone playing a character that's basically learning to be a person, learning to be a grown-up. And the director is a guy named Yorgos Lanthanos. He did a movie called The Lobster with Colin Farrell a couple of years ago, which is bizarre um but he's a visionary guy it almost has kind of a tim burton vibe because it's such a different world um mm -hmm. it is definitely going to be a best picture nominee and i think emma stone is going to win uh for best actress she's the best it's either her or lily gladstone for killers of the flower moon i can't really decide i'm guessing emma stone is going to win but definitely check it out Mm -hmm. Four things it's one of the best movies of the year and Emma, anatomy of the fall by the way anatomy of a fall if I make my list of top movies, we should do that on an upcoming podcast. Mm -hmm. Anatomy of a Fall and Past Lives are, I think, my two favorite movies this year. Yeah. Really, and really and well, for me, and, and Holdovers was- Holdovers was also great. Great. So um, I wanted to, before we get to uh, Will Brill from Fellow Travelers, uh, we're recording this on January the 3rd. I don't know the exact date it's going to come out, but I thought you might be interested in hearing- uh, some of our holiday hijinks. Now, 
So I got um, a massage chair for Christmas. Yes. And let me tell you something. This thing sucks you in and massages the absolute shit out of you. I mean, it is just, it is, I mean, every part of your body gets massaged. It's every bit as good as going to a masseur or a masseuse and getting a massage. It is that good. And I've got it in front of my TV and I wake up every morning. I watch Mike Greenberg on the get up later on. I watch, uh, you know, whoever's on CNN or whatever, uh, sitting in the massage chair, hardly paying attention, couple of gummies and just floating through the world. Wow. Well, you know what I think you should do? What? I think you should have a massage party. Oh, a massage party. Everybody wants to try the chair. Everybody wants to do it. Yeah, of course. I, I want to come over now. Uh, you you are welcome to come over and try the chair. Uh, so and then maybe try- and then maybe when I'm there, I can pick up my sweatshirt. Yeah, yeah, that's. <laughs> I still have your sweatshirt here. You have, have my culture pop sweatshirt for I have like your six months I, now. I have your sweatshirt. Yeah, I know. I, I have a feeling I'm that you gave it to somebody else. I did. I, my mom's wearing it now. No, I just got it set aside for you. Speaking of my mom, had a honestly, I think this was the best holiday season I have had probably in life. Wow. It was so good. My mom and not stepdad Leo were here. Uh, We went to see Love Actually at the Wallace Theater. And my mom, when she walked out, she said, that is the greatest show I've ever seen. Mm. Made me feel so good. Uh, We went to a great old school Italian restaurant called Vito's in Santa Monica. Uh, we went to uh, Lowry's with the spinning salad bowl and Christmas carolers walking around and singing at your table and a big slab of prime rib and a spinning salad and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it was it was absolutely fantastic. And then Sue, all of a sudden, we're supposed to go somewhere for three nights and we were going to go to Calistoga. We were going to go to Ojo Caliente in New Mexico. We were going to go to Cabo in the end. Night before, I said, let's go to New York. Hmm. And we went to New York City um, and got there Wednesday night, uh, then went to see a show on Thursday, went to see two shows on Friday, went to my favorite Chinese restaurant, went to the duplex down in the village. Hmm. Um, It was a perfect, perfect trip. Uh, And New York is so beautiful during the holidays. Um, And I did New York-y kind of thing. Like I was was going to the theater. I was in Times Square. I went to the Rockefeller Center. I did sort of the New York-y touristy things. It was great. Did you go ice skating in Rockefeller Center? My God, no. (laughs) You've seen my ice skating. I am not ice skating ever again. Embarrassing. Embarrassing. I worked there. I worked the promenade restaurant. Did you really? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So... uh, I was going to say, what, what about you? What about your holiday? I what had the polar I, opposite of you. You had a your, bad holiday. Well, I wouldn't want to say it was bad. It was bad. It just wasn't as exciting as yours and um, full of, uh, you know, we, we didn't really, we, first of all, New Year's Eve, we, we never do anything. So you yeah, weren't we don't New either. Year's Eve. You didn't. Okay. So we just yeah. stayed home. Um, Tom wasn't feeling good. The dog's not feeling good. So um, we were supposed to go to Palm Desert. Uh, the right. day before Christmas and then, you know, spend four days at this really cool um, RV park that we love to go to. Mm. So we had to cancel that. And um, Tom's birthday was the 26th. So uh, Ladman, Kathy Ladman came yep. over and the three of us went out to a great dinner, great Italian restaurant in Long Beach, uh, Paola Chia. Mm-hmm. And, um, but we, uh, it was very, very low key. You know, yeah. it was a lot of uh, just, Staying home, catching up on shows that I haven't seen. I I caught up on The Bear. I watched both seasons of The Bear. Oh, had you never seen it? I saw the first couple of episodes of the first season, and I didn't like it. Oh, really? It was too frenetic, and I just couldn't get into it. That's the vibe, yeah. I liked the second season a lot better. Um, So you're not a big Bear fan? Well, I, I actually... Uh, came to like it a lot, a okay. lot more in the second season, and I loved individuals like performances. Oliver Platt is insanely good yeah, he's in really the good, show. really good. Um, and there was a scene in the second season that dinner, the holiday dinner scene, 
Was that, that the one that was all one shot? It was all one shot. It was a one yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's a crazy episode. It's it unbelievable would, that they're able to do it. It made me so uncomfortable. Yeah, because it's like, this is what it's like to work in a fancy kitchen with a bunch of chefs. It's like, it's intense. I mean, you did Top Chef. Um, this is like pressure cooker kind of thing when they're doing that one episode. It wasn't that episode. Well, it, it was, it was, that episode was amazing too. That those were my two favorite episodes okay. of the second season. I'm talking about the holiday family holiday with Jamie Lee Curtis playing the mom. Oh God, yeah, Jamie Lee. I forgot with she was clock, on there. with the clock. You know, the timer going off. Yeah, and she's yeah. crazy, and and the the brother who died is crazy. Yeah, I mean just just everything that was going on, different pockets of story. Um. It was amazing, and uh, God, I'd, I'd love to have the director on because I'd love, or, or or you know, the the showrunner, just to know um, what, how much of that was 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 scripted, how much of it was improvised, yeah, because it was so uncomfortably real. Yeah, I think the performances. I mean, Jeremy Allen White is absolutely fantastic, and uh, his brother is. Eben Moss Backrack. And he is great also. He's the guy who's just sort of along for the ride. And then Io Edabiri uh, plays the sort of assistant chef. She's fantastic also. So you, great You're talking about his brother or you're talking about his cousin? The guy who plays his cousin. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. The guy who plays his, his cousin. Co his the guy who plays dead. his cousin. Spoiler alert. It? The brother's dead. Bernthal. Is that his last name? Oh, no, John Bernthal like, plays the brother. Yeah, plays the brother. Flashbacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know who I love? I love the introduction of his love interest, Molly Gordon. Yeah. Who was in the um the TV series Animal Kingdom. Oh, was she really? Yeah. Yeah, she was great. She is so good in this. Yeah, yeah. The, the bear is well, we're actually gonna do an Emmy uh preview show. We'll we'll talk about the bear and all the big shows that are nominated. Um all right. So your holidays were just kind of eh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it it wasn't anything um spectacular, but um it was you know it was cozy. Yeah, nice. And, you know, a lot of you know great home cooked meals. Yeah, and a, a lot of you know great catching up on watching stuff. And yeah, that's good. Know, that's it was good. fine. It was By the fine. way, New Year's Day was my me and Juan's Juan and I. What? How would I say this? Juan and I. Juan and I had our 18th anniversary. Ah. Which is like. Damn. You start thinking about it. You're like 18 years. Wow. I mean, I always do the joke. That's like 50 and gay years, but it is 50 <laughs> and gay years. Do you have uh, any other gay friends that have been together that, that long? Nope. Hmm. Nope. In most cases, they, they come and they go. They hang on for a couple of years and they're out the door. No, it's. it's now, what, uh, now, what, now, why is that? Why would you say that is? Because I think. Gay guys view sex differently than straight people. But is it is it all about the sex in a relationship? In a mm. gay relationship? At the beginning it is, sure. Yeah, well, you know, um, but isn't it deeper is it isn't it deeper than I mean, obviously your relation with Juan is deeper than that. It is, it is. Years. So it it are, are gay relationships notoriously not as deep as a uh, hetero relationship? Uh, let's see, not as deep. Well, that's an interesting question. I would say, I would say, we've talked about this a little bit, uh, man and libido. Yeah. So you put a bunch of guys with a high libido into a situation where they're potentially going to hook up and they tend to hook up. And I've, I've, uh, for example, I've got a, two, uh, gay friends who are in a relationship who have an open relationship and I'm like, Pfft. No way. No way. Does not work. It would never work for me. Would never work for me. Me neither. But it is the in the gay community, it's sex, it's more permissive. It's more permissive, maybe. I don't want to say uh what's the other word I was thinking? Not permissive, but anyway, it's 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 a weird, it's a weird world. We talked about body counts last episode, mine is high. Right, right, right. Mine is higher. Um all right, here we go. Oh, before, before you do that, I want to say, Juan, I love you. You're the love of my life. It's been the 18 greatest years of my life. 
Uh, and I owe so much of it to you. So Juan, I love you. 18 years of magic. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You guys are a great couple. Yeah. We, we really, uh, we, we really, um, are together forever. All right, here we go. Our guest today has built a great Broadway career including his role in the Tony award-winning 75th anniversary production of Oklahoma. His television work includes the OA, Gotham, and the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. His latest project is the Golden Globe-nominated limited series, Fellow Travelers on Showtime. Will Brill joins us. Hey, Will, thanks a lot for coming on, man. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. So we love fellow travelers. It is easily my favorite show of 2023. I, I just think w we had Ron Nicewanner on the show. Brilliant guy. It. Show is amazing. Um, when you're playing a guy like Roy Cohn, who is just yeah. a despicable, awful character with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. Sure. In, sure. Your, <laughs> in your actor's head, are you thinking, I'm a, are you playing it as a bad guy? Are you playing it as a good guy? How do you play it? It's a great question. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting challenge because I think what happens with playing villains a lot is really the only difference is that all of the sort of rules that regular people have around their decorum, around how to act, around what their uh, power is, all of that stuff disappears. And so Roy really operated as somebody for whom there were no there were no laws governing, you know, he could, he saw himself as such a powerful figure that he could yell in the face of um, representatives of the army. He could boss around senators. Like he just at 26 years old, he believed that he was as powerful as God. Um, and I think what's really fun about the way that he was written is that he uh, also was struggling with these laws governing his insides he was somehow powerlessly in love with somebody and um i think came up against a big wall sort of like i can't how do i make this person fall in love with me i can do everything else in my life i can do anything i want but i can't make myself fall out of love with this person and i can't make this person fall in love with me which uh, you know, a character in conflict is the most fun thing to play, really. Well, when you're playing a character like this, do you do you have to like the character? Do you have to have compassion for the character? I mean, I think it's it doesn't it. <sighs> This this may feel like a little bit of a cop out, but I don't think it goes that deep. I think it's more that you have to see yourself in this situation as it is, and you're fighting for what you want, and you feel passionately about those things. And rules apply to you, or they don't apply to you. I have to. I think I have to believe that I'm right. And that, mm -hmm. like, I want what I want, um, and that I may not care about whose feelings I hurt in the process, but uh, you know, I, I think, I think, no, I don't think I have to have a lot of compassion for him because I don't think he had a lot of compassion for himself. Yeah, I think mm. he, I think there's a lot of self hatred there, and that is also a very interesting and fun thing to play. Well, again, I, 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 go ahead, I, Sue. I just have one other, I, if, if you were going to do a character question, I just wanted to stay on this for one second. Yeah. Um, I want to know when it when it comes all together for you, because you had to wear a prosthetic, a nose prosthetic. And um, as an actor, um, you know, I, but basically that's really what I want to know. When is it, When does it fully come together for you where you feel like I am this guy? Yeah, that's such a good question. I think it um, it happens at different points in the process, whatever the project is that you're working on. In in TV, it's it's such an interesting difference from theater because in in theater you have the words and you have the other people for weeks before you're ever showing this thing to people. So all of a sudden, kind of at the 11th hour, you get dressed up as this person, you get their hair, and there are these there are these new uh, elements that you're suddenly contending with. 
And so often I feel like in theater, it, it really comes together um, and crystallizes at that 11th hour. But in TV, you get all of those external things before you even share space with the other actors. And so there was a lot of time for me to inhabit Roy by myself, which is great also because sometimes you have no other people around. It's just you and the camera and this prosthesis and these clothes. And fortunately, I mean, the the team of people who built the external Roy Cohn were, are all geniuses. And the amount of time that I had with Jordan Samuel, who put that nose on me every day, uh, that was, a, and, and did my eyebrows and his skin tone. Those were really um, important, an important hour and a half that I had every day to sort of lock into Roy. And then the clothes that Joseph Lacourt put on me, I mean, it, it does a long way to give a person a huge sense of power when you're wearing those kinds of suits and ties, you know. Um, so, yeah, well, does that you know, answer I, your question? Mm-hmm, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. I, I was going to say, you know, despicable guy. <laughs> I'm emphasizing despicable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And yet you get to that moment where David Shine, who's the guy that is the object of his affection, mm-hmm. um, looks at him and says, I'm not like you. Yeah. And for just, I had this much, comp- like the tiniest bit of compassion for him. Yeah. I thought you brought humanity to that role, particularly you. in your reaction when David Shine said that. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, as I was listening to uh, y'all's talk with Ron, and I think something that is really beautiful that he said and something that I have always thought in the characters that I've played and in um, trying to interact with the world and, and you know, uh, interact with my own life and my own history is that human beings are capable of doing bad things. And even the most despicable human beings are human beings. And they may not have all of the human feelings that everyone has, but they do have some human feelings and uh, contend with many of the same experiences that the rest of us do. And so I find it easy. I find it um, easy to lock it. You know, we've all had situations in which we feel spurned by a lover or we feel, or by a friend um, and, or when we feel like an outsider. And so those moments are, easy to tap into. And I think it's, um, really, really complicated for an audience to see somebody who they hate so much having an experience that is very familiar to them. Does it, does it take, um, some decompression after playing a role like this, you know, to, to shed some of the stink of, of who this guy was? Yeah, maybe some, I, you know, I was very, uh, I, Early on, I watched the two amazing documentaries that are made about Roy Cohn, Where's My Roy Cohn, and Bully Coward Victim. Um, I watched them a lot, and I watched a lot of clips of Roy, and I was reading uh, a biography of Roy. And so he was living rent-free in my head, as they say, um, for a lot of time. Inhabiting him was not so difficult. It was... um, there is something, oh gosh, am I going to sound like a monster for saying this? There is something uh, relieving about being in a safe space, a space which is safe enough in which you can take all of the sort of um, human and empathetic limits that we place on ourselves, being able to shed them in a place where, and being able to be just sort of like pure id and to be very um, rough with other people in a place where you know you're not hurting anybody and you know that that is actually the assignment. So that was, and and also the people who I was surrounded by, I mean, Matt Visser, who plays David Shine, became a lifelong friend working mm-hmm. on the thing. And uh, a, a lot of the cast were so, so easy to work with. All of the directors were incredibly easy to work with. And Ron was there every single day and was just such a cheerleader and champion of everyone that having a crew that is that supportive makes the process actually 
very easy and being able to, you know, take a, a van home with Matt and decompress and talk about the scenes that we had just done was actually very special. And also I got to have my dog on set. So it was nice to be able to get into the van nice. and have my dog right next to me. And, you know, what's cool your dog's name? There. Molly. Molly. Uh, what, uh, what breed? What, how old? She is um, a chow mix. So she's got a blue tongue and a really like big fluffy uh, mane and yeah. pointy ears. She's 10 years old. A friend mm -hmm. asked me to, uh, to dog sit essentially 10 years ago and within a week i had made her an instagram account and i was just like this is done this i know man it yeah, happens it, it happens that fast it happens so fast i was turning to my girlfriend and just like she's ours now we keep her now i guess she's ours you know i i can walk down a street down the street and see a dog and it happened actually just recently i left a restaurant with my husband and this couple was sitting outside and they had just found this unbelievably cute dog yeah and i you know that that stays with me that like like i wanted the dog i couldn't stop mm -hmm. thinking about the dog <laughs> yeah um, totally especially yeah. when you see a dog that like you know has been found a dog that needs rescue it's been a powerful experience molly was found in a kill shelter in tennessee and we've been back to tennessee twice and every time we go back I sort of shake my fist at Tennessee and I say, we beat you. Yeah. Molly yeah. and I won, you know? You know, it's um, so funny. I had a dog loose in my neighborhood. This maybe six months ago. And uh, I always stop. If I see a dog loose, I'm like, stop. It's somebody's dog. If it was my dog, I'd want somebody to round him up. So yeah. grab this dog. Very cute. Very small kind of mix thing. And there's a number on it. And I call the number and uh, they say, uh, yeah, this is Marsha. Uh, so I'm talking to Marsha and it's her dog and we bring the dog back to her and it's Marsha Gay Harden. No, Academy no really? Marsha Gay Harden. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was well, awesome. That's hilarious. That's <laughs> it was so awesome. cool. So uh, Fellow Travelers has now been nominated for uh, two Golden Globe Awards, three yeah. Critics' Choice Awards. Um, I love it. I've never seen anything like it on TV. Um, yeah. I, 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 it was educational. I did not know enough about the lavender scare. Like I know about the red scare. I didn't realize how intense the lavender scare was during that period. Um, I think this is a landmark series for the way it portrays gay life in the fifties and into the eighties. Do you have a sense that you were making something really important while it was going on? For sure. I mean, I, I, uh, yes. When I first read the script, I was really knocked out at how great the writing was and you know when when you audition you only get one or two scenes to read but i was immediately taken with how beautiful and complicated and intelligent the writing was and then when i got to read the episodes oh uh, th there was a a new revelation of oh this is important and sweeping and but even then when you get those scripts and you you look at them, you kind of think like, well, but what's it going to look like? What's the pacing going to be like? Or is it going to be able, how often do you read a script and then see the thing on TV and think, oh, they, they really didn't get that right. Um, and this, mm -hmm. this felt so important and beautiful. And I think everybody felt a real responsibility to do it justice. And then, um, so when I, started meeting the other actors and realized how seriously they were taking the process and then meeting the directors and the producers it felt very very important and i think we all felt very protective of it and very sort of uh i don't want to say precious because it was also a deeply fun experience like it was so joyful all the way through um I uh, I came away from it feeling like, okay, I'll be totally honest. I haven't watched the whole show yet. Get out of here. Because, <laughs> you yeah, know how it I ends? haven't watched it. I, no, I know how it ends. I know okay, how it ends. Okay, we're not going to spoil it. <laughs> yeah, but, but I, I haven't watched it because it this happens to me every now and then. You work on a project and you say to yourself, that was such a good experience. That was so profoundly important to me personally that i am i'm so glad that it is touching other people in a similar way but like i i don't know if anything can exceed my experience of it it was and then 
my my girlfriend has been hounding me to watch the show. And so we finally watched the first episode. And I just wept and wept at the end of it because it is so beautiful. It's so moving and it's so profoundly well done. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it did feel like a landmark. It's so cool to, it feels like a landmark thing in television. And it also is so much a landmark experience for my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a really special thing to be a part of. Hmm. So I want to talk about some of your other career highlights. You were in one hmm. of the craziest television series of all time, <laughs> um, the OA. Yeah. It's created by Britt Marling, and I apologize for the pronunciation. I think it's Zal Batmanglij. Batmanglij, I believe. Bat yeah. Batmanglij. Um, yeah. And if you haven't seen it, it's it's very it's impossible to. Just, I can't even think how I would go about describe how would you what's the show about you describe it I mean it, to give any detail feels like you know uh uh feels reductive because it is so sweeping and so bananas yeah um, it is but I will say that it's cre it it has accumulated such a sincere and beautiful following of people who feel deeply, deeply seen by it. It is a show for anyone who has ever felt like an outcast. It is for um I, I think it really speaks to uh um queer communities and minority communities because it is about seeing things from the outside. It is about meeting your community of unlikely people it's about being it's about meeting other uh, meeting other people who feel imprisoned by the same things that you feel imprisoned by and it's about longing for a life that is not yours and it's all told through science fiction and with a with a tinge of spirituality thrown yes, in there, there as well is. Mm -hmm. sure. there's yeah. totally spirituality in there and it is um it's just a blast of a show and also very different from a lot of the TV that you see nowadays in that it is like fellow travelers. It is not something you can put on in the background. Yep. It requires your attention and the payoff for that attention is extreme. The, I mean, the final but, episode of season one, I was like, oh my God, I yeah. nobody could have ever seen this coming. Yeah. And then the final episode of season two, when the final moments of season yes. two happened, I was reading them on my phone and I threw my phone across the room. <laughs> I said, get out of here. This is crazy. You cannot do that. Um, and I think they really pulled it off. I think yeah, it's so they good. did. I, they absolutely yeah. did. Well, even yeah. even with your attention, Steve and I were talking about it recently, and I was saying how I needed to take a class to kind of understand. Totally. And, what the hell is this? I know the amount of experts who are on the internet who are like constantly pointing things out, going down all the rabbit holes. They've sort of Zal and Brit somehow figured out they like they like talk about crowdsourcing in the TV show. It's a huge part of season two, and now there are people out in the world crowdsourcing theories about the show. It's just so yeah, fantastic. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so you did, uh, marvelous Mrs. Maisel, which is one of the best shows on TV. Um, yeah. you know, the one, the thing I love most about the show is the production design. Mm -hmm. It is, they have done such an amazing job of recreating these historic and the, the fountain blue hotel. I mean, all this stuff, they captured that era in such a way. Uh, what, it, what was it like working in that show? Uh, Amy, uh, shared, uh, Amy Sherman Palladino is, you know, to the brilliant mind behind it. What was, what was that experience like? I mean, it's a, a dream. I, I don't get to spend a whole, I, I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time there. I, you know, my character comes in and out and there, there are large parts of seasons where I'm not there, but I felt so lucky that Every time I was on set, I was either with Rachel Brosnahan or Tony Shalhoub or Marin Hinkle or Kevin Pollack or Caroline Aaron or Michael Zegan, just these titans, you know, these who I got to sit back and sort of watch work was a really, really formative and moving experience. And you're right, the attention to detail on that show, from the writing to the costumes to the sets, uh, is unparalleled and that has a lot to do with amy and dan her husband dan paladino are absolutely um unflinching and uncompromising in their vision and uh they 
they do such an amazing job of making sure every single piece fits together in a, an incredibly satisfying way. It was such a cool experience to be a part of that show and was really sad to say goodbye to it, but all good things must come to an end, you know? Yeah. You know, being Jewish, you know, she really captured the Jew of that era, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, and some of the stuff, like there was a, there was that great scene when the, the, the Catskills storyline, when you're all sitting at the table having a meal <sighs> and that cross talk and just, it, it reminded me a little bit of Woody Allen, you know, oh, totally. like Annie Hall or, yeah. you know, um, where it's, you know, just, Jews like going wild, basically. <laughs> yes, you know, it was yes. just so much fun to see. And there was something else. You know, I By know the way, that at Sue's house, the show is not called Marvelous <laughs> Mrs. Maisel. It's called Jews Go Wild, apparently. Well, <laughs> well, it really is with you know Tony with the conversations and how yeah, they're always yeah. yelling at each other and you <laughs> it's know incredible. Um, but there was um there was a great, great scene, and I wonder and i i don't know did you ever see that uh that marx Bro brothers movie a night at the opera i have i i might have seen a night at the opera in high school but i haven't seen it since okay well i was wondering if if this was an homage to it that scene at the bell labs when you're sitting oh, with yeah. tony shalou oh and, yeah <laughs> and when it, it was just comic masterpiece how one by one as you and tony are sitting there uh, more more employees oh, keep walking so in the room great. one one by one. Which yeah. In, in Night of the Opera, it was the same thing in the state room. Oh, one amazing. by one in this tiny state room, one by one, more people just kept on coming in and coming in and coming in till people were like up against the yeah. wall. <laughs> it was very, very funny. I wouldn't uh, but, be surprised. I mean, Amy and Dan have... A, a very rich, like, encyclop encyclopedic knowledge of film and of comedy. And also, they function in, uh, they're, they're very musical. So, like, anything, uh, all of the dialogue is written not just to be incredibly uh, logical and witty, but it's also got a rhythm and a cadence that is incredibly important. I mean, and the two of them know every single word. When you're working, they mm. know exactly how the thing is plotted out. It's really amazing to witness. So I just got back from New York. I was there over the holidays. I'm a complete and total Broadway nerd. Um, cool. So got there like Wednesday night, uh, saw a show on Thursday, saw two shows on Friday, flew out of town. I, I love Broadway. I, when I was a little amazing. kid, I wanted to go to, I wanted to be on Broadway. As Sue knows, I always wanted to be on Broadway when I was cool. growing up. Uh, and as a little kid, I would go to, uh, at, well, in high school, we made the senior class trip and I uh, saw Jennifer holiday in dream girls, which was oh, amazing. Amazing. So, uh, um, the, the great Geraldine page in Agnes of God, which was oh, incredible. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, and I went to the stage door for all this. I was amazed. So I'm, I'm wondering from you. Because you've done Broadway, you did the big seventy uh, fifth anniversary production of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. When you're doing a show, what's the what's the rhythm of life like? So you oh, get yeah, up at question. what time in the morning? You do the show. Do you stay up all? How's it all come together for you in terms of life? Well, it's uh, it's such a great question. I'm I mean it varies sometimes depending on the show. Oklahoma was a really big show. It was a long show. It was three plus hours. Um, I was riding my bike to and from the theater. So I was in amazing shape, um, which was really uh, a dream. But typically it is a weird thing to only have your job at night. Um, and there is a danger in that, um, in that the, the theater can be a very social, uh, industry and, um, you know, sometimes you do wind up going out to bars after the show and drinking a fair amount. And that during that show, I, uh, started to feel like, oh, I'm so fit because of all of my singing and dancing and riding my bike that maybe my, that I could sort of, I could sort of like drink with abandon. And it was after that show and after the pandemic that I got sober and I'm, I'm like two and a half years sober now. And I've been in a few shows since then. And the rhythm of life has changed pretty dramatically in this very wonderful way. And so I feel like I'm just now having the real experience of what 
uh, a real um, life schedule is when working in the theater, um, which is to say that it, once the show opens, it is uh, a pretty, it's, it's kind of lovely. You get your full day, you get to like see friends and family. And then when the show is, and then the show happens and you go home, um, I will say I just did a show. I just did two shows in New York back to back and they overlapped for two weeks. I was doing a small production of Uncle Vanya in a loft and then two weeks of those performances overlapped with a play called Stereophonic that I was doing at Playwrights Horizons, which is about a band in the 70s. And so I was getting up and going to rehearsal at 10 a.m. every morning and having four hours of band practice and then four hours of text rehearsal and then going straight to Uncle Vanya and performing there until 11 p.m. Wow. So I would get home at 12 or 12.30 and then get up at 8.30 to get and to do it all over theater. again. Man, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that is, it's kind of the dream and the nightmare to do two plays at the same time. But uh, it was really satisfying. Both productions were uh, very dreamy to be a part of. I feel very, very lucky. Wow, such polar opposites too, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. To, to jump from from one kind of genre to another, that must have been very challenging. It was very challenging, but it was also very dreamy and very... Um, uh, yeah, kind of the the kind of challenge that one really hopes to experience at some point, you know. So you went to uh, Carnegie Mellon at, in mm-hmm. uh, Pittsburgh, which is, I think Pittsburgh is the most underrated city in America. I absolutely oh, love best. Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. Have you ever, did you ever, and I, I'm guessing you did, go to Permanti Brothers? Of course, of yeah. course. I yeah. love Primanti Brothers. Primanti Brothers and um, the, may it rest in peace, the original hot dog shop was yep. a favorite haunt, which no longer exists, unfortunately. But yes, I loved I loved uh, Pittsburgh as a city. And I still, any chance I get, I'll put French fries in a salad yeah. as an homage <laughs> to yeah. the city. Did, did you yeah. go to Eaton Park? Of Eaton course, Park. Eaton Park, now, a classic. Now, Jim's well, going I, down I to Eaton Park. Well, because yeah, I, I used right. to do stand up, so I used to perform in Pittsburgh oh. quite quite often. And we used always, as comics, we used to joke that they had it wrong. You should park and then eat. Yeah, of course you should. Eaton <laughs> Park is very. It sounds dangerous. <laughs> yes, it does. Eat and yeah. then park. Well, it depends uh, what, yeah, what, what I, you're eating. I love well. the Yunzers. My, I have a family of Yunzers that. Uh, oh my <laughs> God, Mom, what are you doing? Yeah, um, yeah, totally. Oh, that's good. Uh, so I. I found an article about, and I hate to bring this up because it's, you have a criminal record. Oh gosh, I do. <laughs> um, you told this story to broadway.com. What, what yeah. did you get busted for? How much time did you do? All that kind of stuff. Well, let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> I, so I didn't wind up doing any hard time per se, but <laughs> when I was, I did a lot of, I did maybe a summer's worth of picking up, like basically community service, picking up trash off the highway. Right. When I was 15 years old, oh. I was uh, arrested for making fake driver's licenses. Um, Whoa. It w- yeah, it was a gnarly thing to get involved in. I was warned from all sides to don't do this thing, but I'm a very <laughs> slow learner is something that I've learned about myself yep. um, over, you know, 37 years. Um, and so w- when I was arrested, uh, I had I had been warned by my brother and by friends, like, you have to stop doing this. It's a terrible idea. Um, I had been, it, it wasn't like I was the mastermind of this thing. I had been sort of coaxed into this uh criminal ring as it were by another student another <laughs> 15 year old student um and then uh but it's it's wild we you know we thought we were just it was essentially like an extracurricular job we were just making money and we were using computers and we thought and we were being creative in some way and uh then we got busted and the 
police were very impressed. They said, these are the best fake IDs we've oh, ever seen. Well, that's, that's um, Why, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the California uh, driver's license design changed the next year. I don't mm. want to say that it was necessarily because of us, but it was probably because of us. And then um, even the OC, the TV show, the OC had a line in one of their episodes immediately after where they said... Uh, uh, one, I think uh, one of the characters said to another character, they're trying to find fake IDs, and they were like, you know, there are these guys in Menlo Park who are making really good fake IDs, which wow. is where I grew up. So that Congratulations. was Congratulations. If you're going to break the law, break it well. So, Thank you. So, so, so was, this, was this to get into bars at a young age? Was yeah, and it was, you know, it was a very flawed idea from the outset. We were we were taking pictures of people and then putting them on like a template so they had like an ID, but like we weren't making these 15-year-olds look like they were 21. So they would just had these IDs with a with a picture of a 15-year-old on them. So they got taken all the time. I mean, they were beautifully made IDs, but they had pictures of children on them. So I think uh, bouncers were like, this is obviously fake. There is yes. no way this is real, you know? <laughs> well, you, see, um, you see, that was the beauty of growing up in New York, where I grew up. Um, mm -hmm. No, There was no picture IDs for dr on driver's licenses when I was a kid. Oh, wow. So you yeah. can just get someone, some, you know, just get someone else's license. You could take someone Damn. else's license. It was just, it was just sure. paper. You should sure. have franchised. You could have taken over New York, too. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You know, uh, but yeah. Uh, last last thing for you, I, I, you have a unique skill that uh, I don't, I've never talked to anybody who is able to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And you can't take it with you. You played the xylophone. Yeah, do I have that right? right. So that's what is right. the art of playing a xylophone? How much did you practice it? All that kind of stuff. You know, this is so funny. I'm only realizing this now, but the xylophone, I've only played an instrument on stage twice and you can't take it with you. I played the xylophone and in this play that I just did off Broadway in stereophonic, I play the bass, um, neither of which I played prior to doing these shows, but they are both, they're similar in that they are instruments that sort of straddle melody and percussion. Um, and I love that about them. I mean, the bass is so fun because is it, it's the rhythm section. It, it's married to the drums, but it also is like playing the underline of the melody. Um, and the xylophone kind of does the same thing, but is more of a standalone piece. Anyway, I didn't play it well. I played two songs and, um, my brother recently reminded me that it was about a 50 50 chance that, you know, it was going to, that I was going to play the whole song well in a performance. Um, but what was really cool about that experience was Jason Robert Brown wrote the interstitial music in that play. He wrote the xylophone songs. And so he personally taught me how to play the xylophone. Wow. And I was very starstruck. I was like, this is the guy who wrote Parade and the last five years, these seminal um, musicals from my childhood. And I bit my tongue. I, I kept reminding myself, xylophone rehearsal is not the place to tell this guy that you are obsessed with his oeuvre, you know? Um, but it was a very, very cool experience. Yeah. Well, uh, listen, this has, been, this has been, is it everything you ever dreamed of this show? <laughs> yeah, it yeah. really, it really um, is. It really is like the, um, it is the luckiest experience. It is not all the time that you get to work with, um, incredible material on something that pays you well and where you make incredible friends. This is yeah. such a rarity. It is such a dream to be a part of this thing. I'm really, really lucky. So fellow travelers is streaming now on Showtime. It's nominated for all kinds of awards. Uh, Matt, Bomer, Jonathan Bailey, uh, Will, a great, uh, tremendous performances, Roy Cohn. We uh, thank you so much for coming out. We're, we're always happy to talk about this show and your career is amazing. And, uh, congratulations and continued success, man. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Stephen, Stephen Sue. It's so nice to meet you too. Nice to meet you too, you man. Too. There you have it. There is Will Brill and the show is I, I mean, we've gone on and on about it on this. Show. It is fantastic. So if you've not watched Fellow Travelers, what the hell are you doing with your life? So I have an addendum. Um, we had a conversation on, I don't know if it was the last podcast. I think Maybe the I last think show of the year. The last show of the year where we were talking about who watches porn. And yes. you said that all men watch porn. Yep. And I said, there's no way in the world 
that Tom watches porn. And you were like, yeah, right. Um, and I said, okay, well, I'll ask him. So <laughs> I did. And he has such a guilty look, you know? He, there, there was a pause after I asked yeah, him that. Yeah. And he, at first he said, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I have. Uh, you know, I used to watch it, basically. And I said, well, do you watch it now? Like, is it, is it a current thing? He says, um, yeah, yeah, I watch it sometimes. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. I said, <laughs> I never would have thought that you would watch it. So then I took it further and I was having, I was on a Zoom with my brother. He was helping me with something on my computer. Yeah. So I said, oh, I have to ask you a question. I said, um, do you watch porn? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, um, I, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny how guilty how guilty the two of them were. Yeah, see, and I don't own it, man. You watch and porn? he said he said he doesn't watch it anymore. And I don't know. If, oh, he gave his up. Wife porn? was in the. Well, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I think he was being honest with me. But he said he said yeah. He says I have. He says but I don't anymore. Yeah, virtually all men. I I contend that virtually all men watch porn. So now there, my goal free. is to. My goal is to ask every guy I know if they watch porn. Oh, I think it's a fantastic plan. Good <laughs> strategy to get a really weird reaction from guys. Um, hey, I want to remind everybody, if you're watching on YouTube, subscribe to this channel so you won't miss any shows and leave a comment, leave a reaction. That's always great. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you can subscribe to this uh, podcast and leave us a five-star review uh, and a rating and a comment and all that stuff. All the reviews and the comments and all that stuff help us with the magical algorithm as we continue to grow the show. Sue, great show. Thank you very much. And we will see everybody next time on the Culture Pop Podcast. <laughs>